Hi, my name is Meredith Overstreet. I'm the wound and ostomy educator for Martha Jefferson Hospital. You're watching this video today because you're going to have a tube placed into your stomach or your small intestine. If it's into your stomach, it'll be called a G-tube or a gastrostomy tube. If it's into your small intestine, it'll be a J-tube or jejunostomy tube. There are several different ways these are placed and one of the most common ways and therefore one of the most common ways we refer to it is a PEG tube or percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube. All that means is that your tube is placed through your abdomen with the help of an endoscope that's passed down through your mouth into your stomach to, with a camera and some other equipment to help the physician actually place the tube. Like I said, that's the most common way that it's done. That's not necessarily the way that yours will be placed. Please make sure that you've talked with your doctor and you understand how your tube will be placed. All those different names are used sometimes interchangeably um, to describe your tube. So you may hear, hear it called a pig tube or G tube or a J tube. Um, they're all varying levels of correct, but for the most part, I'm going to try to call it a G tube or a J tube. So when you uh, leave here today, You'll have um, watched this video to understand the basic care and use of your PEG tube or your G tube or J tube. You'll also receive a yellow folder full of information. In that folder will be a booklet, which has lots of pictures, which I find helpful, and also some printed instructions that I typed up that I'm going to use to go through on our video today. You'll also have my business card in that folder, so you can use that to call me if you have any problems uh, or any questions that aren't answered in the literature that I've provided for you. So I'm going to basically run through this uh, printed pamphlet that I put together. Um, we've talked about what a PEG tube stands for. Um, the next thing I'm going to tell you about is the actual tube. This is the most commonly used tube here at the hospital, and um, it's a soft silicone tube. You notice it it bends very well. It's uh, pretty soft and pliable. Um, these are placed for many different reasons, but usually the, the reason that we're placing them is because uh, you can't either can't take anything by mouth, or we're predicting that down the line you won't be able to take anything by mouth, and this is sort of a, a preventative measure, or we're getting ahead of the ball. Um, or uh, you're able to eat and drink, but you're just not taking enough by mouth, and we need to give you supplemental nutrition and hydration. So any of those reasons can be the case for you. Please understand uh, with your physician what your specific situation is. It may be temporary or permanent, depending on that situation. So again, that's another thing to clarify with your physician if you're not sure whether this is a temporary or a permanent measure. So let's go through the parts and pieces of this tube so you understand all the different components. This is the internal bumper, the part that's actually inside your stomach or your small intestine. You'll notice that it's very flexible and soft. It's also silicone. And if you look right here, you'll see in the center there's the hole where the fluids and uh, feedings actually come out into the uh, stomach or small intestines. This part, if this is the inside of the stomach or small intestine, this sort of butts up against it and um, holds it in place. That's why it's the internal bumper. So moving to the outside of your body, this is the external bumper. This is also soft and silicone, so you can bend it and move it around quite easily. The point of having these two bumpers is to hold it snugly in place against the inside and the outside of your body so that, if you'll notice, when I tug on it, it doesn't play. When I turn it, it doesn't play a whole lot. If that bumper wasn't there, this tube could travel in and out. It could do this little swirly action. And the problem with that is that this and this erode and, and harm that tract or the hole where the tube travels through your body. And it makes it a lot more likely for things like infection or tube dislodgement to happen. So it's very important that these bumpers be in place and snug, not tight. You don't want ulcers to happen from the pressure, but you want them to be snug so that none of that happens. Then you have the length of the tube, and this is kind of a long cut. This is an educational tube, so I left it long on purpose, but um, your tube will probably be a little bit shorter than that. You'll notice also there are markings along the length of the tube. This helps us to determine at what marking or level this tube enters your body so that we can track and make sure it doesn't travel outwards or inwards too much. 
There's a clamp on every tube. This is a pretty simple clamp. It's got little teeth along the top here and this little part catches on those teeth to stay in place. To release it, you just pull up on that top part. It pops open. This is uh, threaded onto the tube so it's not going to fall off when you release the clamp. You can slide it up and down depending on where it's convenient for you. And to put the clamp back into place, you just squeeze, release, squeeze, and you'll see it, it clamps the tube at this spot right here. At the top of the tube are the feeding and medication ports. This particular tube has two ports. Per the manufacturer, the top larger one is the feeding port and the smaller one on the side is the medication port. Really, you can use the top or larger port for both. That's fine. To open it, you just grasp the little little uh, holder there and pull. It's got a little connector to keep it in place so you don't lose it. And you just pop it off to open it up. When you're done doing whatever you need to do, you just push it back on there like a cork. And that's it. So those are the components of the tube. So now we'll talk about how to take care of it and how to take care of yourself while you have a tube in place. You're going to receive some specific written instructions from your physician, discharge instructions on how to take care of your tube. So they'll give you any particular information. Whatever they tell you to do, you need to follow to the letter. I'm going to give you some general information that I give to everybody. So if there's any conflict between what I tell you and what your physician tells you, go with what your physician tells you. Okay. One thing that's very important, we'll get this out of the way at the start. If this tube comes out completely dislodged from your body for whatever reason, that's an immediate call to your physician. Don't delay. Call them back right away because the tract or the hole that um, this travels through into your body can close up very quickly. So it's uh, it has to be replaced within 24 hours. So call your physician's office. There's somebody on call 24 hours a day, so if it, even if it's after business hours, they can contact that person and the doctor can tell you whether you should go to the emergency department or, or what you should do um, to get the tube replaced. But just know that this popping out is an immediate call to your doctor. So let's talk about how to take care of yourself. The first big thing, this might surprise you, is mouth care. The whole point of this is to um, either supplement, in which case you might still be eating and might, might still need to brush your teeth for that reason, but um, or to bypass your mouth and your esophagus and the upper GI tract. Even if that's the case, you still need to brush your teeth or your dentures, whatever the case may be, take care of the inside of your mouth, keep it moist, keep it clean, and moisturize your lips. You don't want any of that to dry out and crack because that can set you up for infection and other problems. So. You still need to brush your teeth and your dentures, moisturize, all that sort of thing. The next uh, thing that we need to talk about is actually cleaning the site. And when I talk about the site, I'm talking about the skin around the insertion site and the hole or tract itself underneath the bumper. So you've got to clean all of this routinely and that means daily. So when you first have the tube placed, you're going to have some drainage, you're going to have some little crusties, little dried blood, dried, dried goobers from the procedure, and that's okay. We've got to clean those off every day though, make sure that they don't set you up for an infection. Um, after that, you shouldn't have any drainage, but you still need to clean it daily. So let's talk about how you do that. First thing you're going to do, and you can do this in the shower, is wash the skin around the tube using mild soap and water. You want to wash it. You can do it outside of the shower with a washcloth, some soap, just clean, rinse the washcloth out, and then rinse the site. And then you want to pat it dry with a dry towel or washcloth. The next thing you have to do is clean underneath this bumper. And again, remember this is a soft, flexible silicone bumper, so you can just lift it up to clean underneath. They recommend doing that with uh, some Q-tips or other type of cotton-tipped applicator. And for the first 10 days after your procedure, you want to use a half-strength hydrogen peroxide solution. So that would be half hydrogen peroxide and half water, so one-to-one. -one. And just dip the Q-tip in that half-strength um, hydrogen peroxide solution and clean underneath. And not only are you cleaning the skin the, around the tract where that hole is, you're also cleaning the underside of this bumper because stuff can get on there and dry and, and you don't want it to get nasty. So you want to clean all around underneath there and the skin and then you need to make sure that it dries. And these little feet help to hold the bumper up a little bit but you still need to dry underneath of there so that you don't set yourself up for moisture problems like yeast infection or breakdown, skin breakdown from moisture. 
So that's for the first 10 days. After the first 10 days, you can continue to use the mild soap and water. If you want to just lift up in the shower and clean underneath, that's fine. Um, and then dry really well afterwards. The other thing that we need to do is every day, for the first 10 days, rotate this tube a quarter turn. And we're talking about rotating the tube and this external bumper. And what that'll do is change the pressure that this external bumper is exerting on your skin so you don't get little little ulcers or wounds from that. It also, by rotating the tube, rotates this internal bumper a little bit to keep it from adhering to the lining of the stomach. If you think about ladies and gentlemen um, who've gotten your ears pierced, when you first got it done you had to rotate your, your earring a little bit each time. It's the same sort of principle. First thing, you want to make sure that everything doesn't stick to the outside. You also need to make sure that everything doesn't stick on the inside of that hole, that tract. The skin is healing around the tube and you want that scar tissue to form around the tube but not on the tube. So you rotate that tube a little bit each day. It allows that tract to form and it keeps the tube free. Okay. The other thing some people do is you've got this tube hanging. You can tape this to your belly. Some people find that to be a little bit more secure. They don't have to worry so much about this being tugged on or snagged on something. It's completely optional. If you do that, just use a very gentle kind of tape. One thing that I didn't mention, always make sure you wash your hands. Wash before you touch your tube, wash after you touch your tube, wash, wash, wash your hands. Um, and when you wash your hands, you want to use soap and water, warm water, and try to sing a song like Happy Birthday or Yankee Doodle while you scrub, and that will make sure that you're washing for long enough before you rinse and dry your hands off. Okay, so day 10, after you've gotten this placed, you're, you've been rotating your bumper, you've been cleaning every day just like you were told, the last thing you're going to do on day 10 is pull the bumper away from the skin a little bit. And this can be kind of hard to do because you have to pull the bumper away without pulling everything out. So if you have any trouble, call your doctor's office because we'd rather you call them to get some help before you yank the tube out than yank the tube out and have to call them to have it replaced. But the point of doing that is the bumper was put on immediately after the procedure very snugly to hold everything in place. But it doesn't have to stay that snugly which once things heal a little bit. So you just rotate or pull that tube back two of those marks just two of those little marks and that just gives you a little bit less pressure against the skin if you wet this it tends to move a little bit easier so that's one helpful little hint but again if you have any trouble just call your doctor's office and ask for help if drainage is present under the bumper that's normal for the first few days after your procedure you'll probably go home with some gauze underneath the bumper um, you can change that for a few days but then after that you shouldn't have drainage under here. Um, if you continue to have drainage, you want to let your doctor know and see if they have any recommendations or any concerns about that. If not, as long as they're okay with the drainage, one thing you can do that's a little bit better than having a piece of gauze underneath there um, is use some zinc oxide based diaper cream like Desitin or one of those brands. Um, the benefit of that is it's a moisture barrier cream so it protects the skin from the moisture but it doesn't it's not a wet piece of gauze being held against your skin because you think about when something wet is against your skin it actually weakens the skin and makes it easier for breakdown to occur so as long as it's okay with your doctor that's one helpful little hint from wound and ostomy nurses so that's basic skin and tube care you also want to wash the tube itself make sure that nothing gets uh, crusted or caked onto that so that's how you take care of the outside of your tube and your skin but you also have the inside of your tube to take care of, the lumen of the tube where everything travels. That can get clogged very easily. So it's important, whether you're giving yourself tube feedings or not, that you flush the tube three to four times a day. Even if you're not using it, it still has to be flushed because your gastric contents can get in that tube and clog it. And then when you need it, you won't be able to use it. So I'm going to teach you how to flush your tube, and, um, and then you'll be ready to do it once you get home. So the equipment that you're going to need to flush your tube will be a catheter tip syringe and we'll give you one of these in your kit to take home with you. One thing you want to check, some of them have caps on them. If you try to put this in there with a cap on, it's not going to do you any good. So check and see if it's got a cap on it. If it does, take it off and set it aside. 
you're going to need a cup of water. You want room temperature to lukewarm water. Um, don't use hot water, don't use cold water. And uh, make sure you've got at least an ounce of that, maybe a couple ounces to flush your tube with. The other thing you want are some paper towels. If you tend to make a mess like me, you want some paper towels handy. Um, also make sure you have a clean surface where you can spread out all your supplies um, on some paper towels or something else to keep them clean. Uh, don't balance them on top of your, your coffee table with all your other things. Um, you want to keep this sort of separate from all of that. So the process for flushing your tube would be set out your clean surface, wash your hands, and then you're going to take your syringe, and this is the body of the syringe, and this part is the plunger. You're going to pull that back and then yank it out completely. Set the plunger aside. I'm going to teach you the first way to flush your tube that does not involve the plunger. This is the way we use in the hospital that we find the easiest uh, way to, to flush tubes and administer things through the tube. So you've got your cup of water handy, you've got your tube in your hand, your clean hands, and you've got your syringe handy. You're going to pull that little stopper out insert your syringe till it's snug and then you just pour your water into the syringe at that point release your clamp and you'll watch gravity do the rest the water is going to travel down the syringe and into the tube now as soon as it gets into the tube you want to clamp your tube again and the reason for that is it'll keep going and your tube will just fill with air and then the next time you want to put something through you're going to have a tube full of air traveling into your stomach and we all know what happens when we get air in our bellies so try to avoid that if at all possible if at that point you were just flushing your tube you would take your syringe out set it aside close your tube and you're done you clean your equipment and move on you could move on at this point to tube feedings but we'll talk about that in a minute so we're going to say that we're done take your syringe out set it aside Put the stopper back in, put the tube down, and then you're going to wash this with soap and water and set it aside to air dry. Take good care of your equipment, and that will take care of you. That's flushing your tube one way. The other way to do it is put your plunger back in, and then instead of just using gravity, you would put the tip of the syringe into your water and pull back on the plunger to draw the water up into the syringe. Then you'd open your tube, fit the syringe into the port, unclamp, and then push. Push this plunger until all the water's in there in the tube, then clamp and remove. If you're done, if you were just flushing, you're done at this point and you can clamp it off. If you were giving yourself tube feedings now, then you'd have to draw up your tube feeds, put it back in, unclamp, push, clamp, draw up more tube feeds, and on and on until you've given yourself the whole feeding. So that's a little bit more tedious, but some people find it easier that way. So just try, try whichever way feels best to you and, and you'll get the hang of it. So let's talk about giving yourself tube feeds now. Um, first thing to, to talk about is very important that we're not giving regular food through the tube. This isn't a pureed hamburger that you're going to uh, push through this tube or you know something you put in the blender that you then push through the tube. Um, you're going to talk with a dietitian before you leave today who's going to help you uh, talk about what tube feeding you're going to use. And the decision will be up to your physician and your dietitian to choose your your particular brand or type. And the reason is that there are different kinds out there for diabetics, people with kidney problems, um, certain types with higher protein levels or lower protein levels depending on what you need. And that's where your dietitian comes in to formulate exactly what you need. So when you get out and you're ordering your tube feedings, stick with what they recommended because it's been chosen specifically for you. Um, It'll come most likely in cans. Some of them come in larger jugs, but usually for home use, they come in cans like Ensure or Boost. Um, and those are a couple brands of, of uh, supplements that are sometimes used as tube feedings. So when you're going to give yourself a tube, your tube feedings, you'd want to have enough of the feeding. You'll be told how much to give at any given time. Um, and there are two ways to feed yourself. There's the bolus method, which is the closest to a meal um, because you give yourself a large amount or 
the all of it that you're supposed to get in one sitting and then you close up your tube and you're done until the next feeding time. That's so it's like a meal. Uh, there is a continuous tube feeding method where you get it either um, from a bag, either off on a pump or by gravity, and it just drips through a tube and which connects to your tube and drips into your stomach over a uh, you know over hours at a certain rate. Um, usually, like I said, it's given by bolus, and if uh, if you're getting a continuous feeding, home health might be involved at that point. So, a couple of important things to know. First of all, just like with the water, you want to give your feedings at room temperature or slightly warm, um, but not hot, not cold. You can refrigerate your tube feedings. Just make sure you use them immediately and uh, cover them when they're in the refrigerator and let them warm back up again before you give them. Um, also, something that's very important to know is that when you get a feeding, you need to have your, your head elevated up uh, 30 degrees or higher. So if you've got a, a hospital bed, raise the head of the bed up um, or put a bunch of pillows behind your back or sit in a recliner or a chair or upright to some degree, at least 30 degrees. The reason for that is that when you lay flat or less than 30 degrees, food can tend to go back, especially liquid food like, like feedings, can tend to travel back up the esophagus and might not even come out your mouth but could travel high enough that they would go back down your windpipe or your trachea and that's called aspiration and that's a very big problem. It causes pneumonia and it's got um, a mortality rate associated with it and we just don't want any problems with that for you. So make sure you're sitting upright during your tube feeding and at least an hour afterwards. So don't feed yourself and then go lay down, okay? So to give yourself a feeding, you again want your catheter tip syringe, either with or without your plunger. I'm going to show you without the plunger. You want your tube feeding, so you can either have the can, or if you have to use a portion of the can or more than one, you can use a big measuring glass um, to pour out how much you need. Make sure that you do that ahead of time. Have your clean surface with all your stuff spread out on it. Have a cup of water, good amount of water, probably about two to three ounces or uh, 60 to 90 milliliters. And then um, you also want to have paper towels handy, again, if you're like me, that you're going to make a mess. So, at this point, what you're going to do is wash your hands and then you're going to open up your tube, insert your syringe, and you're going to flush. So take some of that water, about 20 to 30 milliliters, and pour it in there and then unclamp, let it travel in. And remember, this is gravity, so if you raise it higher, it'll go faster. If you raise, if you lower the tube down, it'll go f uh, slower. So you can control the rate. When the water gets down to the bottom of the syringe or down into the tube, clamp the tube and move on to your tube feedings. At that point, you can fill the syringe up with your tube feeding and then unclamp, let it go, till it gets towards the bottom of the syringe and then clamp it off, pour more in there, unclamp, let it go till it gets towards the bottom, clamp it off again. And basically you're going to keep doing that until you've given yourself all of your tube feeds. When you've finished, you're emptying that can or that measuring cup into the syringe, unclamp and let it go down until it gets to the tube, to into your PEG or G or J tube, clamp it off, and then you want to flush. It's very important to flush so that your tube doesn't get clogged. So pour your water into the syringe, unclamp, and let it travel all the way down into your tube. And then clamp, remove your syringe, set it down, close your tube, and then you would wash your equipment with soap and water and let it air dry. And then wash your hands. If you wanted to, as I kind of demonstrated before with the flushing, if you wanted to do this with the plunger in, you would draw up your tube feeds, push them in, unclamp it from your syringe, or pull it off of your tube, and you'd have to keep doing this back and forth sort of thing until you've given yourself all of your tube feeds. So for flushing, that might work easily, but when you're giving your tube feeds, that might take a little bit longer and be a little more tedious. All right, so that's the bolus method. The continuous method, like I said, um, if you're doing that, you might have home health involved, in which case they'll, they'll help teach you as well at home, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, the next thing I do want to talk about, though, is administering medications, because you will absolutely be giving medications through your tube. So, 
Liquid is the easiest way to give medications through your tube. If you're giving, if you're having or receiving medications right now, you want to talk to your pharmacist to see if you can get a liquid form of it. Um, not all pills can be given through a tube. If they are extended release, sustained release, delayed release, um, enteric coated, any of those sorts of, of medications, you cannot crush them, open them up, uh, puncture them, and, and squeeze them down your tube. Those medications are meant to be released slowly. And if you crush them or uh, interfere with those mechanisms, you're going to give yourself a large amount of medication very quickly. And basically, in essence, it's an overdose. So make sure that if you're on any of those types of medications, you let your doctor know and ask what you should do instead. Also, um, make sure any physician who prescribes you a medication is aware that you're giving it through a tube so that they can give you a liquid form or um, that they can make sure they don't give you one of those uh, no-no types like extended release medications. All right, so if you're going to give yourself medications, again, it's best to give it liquid. If, uh, if you have to give yourself a tablet or a gel cap or a liquid gel cap, um, make sure you crush the tablet really well, open the gel cap, um, puncture your liquid gel caps and squeeze them out into a cup. The other thing, it's very tempting, very easy to, to mix all your medications in one little cup and give them all at once. The problem with that is that um, a lot of those medications can interact with each other and clog your tube. So it's incredibly important that you give your medications one at a time. And that sounds incredibly tedious, but believe me, it's going to be better for you and your tube in the long run. So if you're going to give yourself medications, make sure you have all of them ready to go. Uh, make sure you've crushed all your tubes. Just pour a little bit of water, or crushed all your tablets, sorry. And um, pour a little bit of water in with them, or the granules from a gel cap or whatever, and mix them up a little bit. And then you're going to go, like you're going to flush your tube. You'll make sure it's clamped, open it up, have your... Have your syringe ready without the plunger. Seat that in the port and then you'll just flush with a little bit of water. Let that go through until it gets into your tube. Clamp it off. And then you're going to pour in your first medication. Then you'd unclamp, let it run down. It's probably only going to be a little bit. Let it run in to the tube, clamp it off, and then you're going to follow with about 15 to 20 milliliters of water. Unclamp, let that run into the tube, and then clamp. And then continue that process with each of your medications. If you're giving yourself a crushed up tablet or gel cap or any of those sorts of things, you want to make sure when you dump it in that you check and make sure that there wasn't half the medication still stuck to the bottom of the cup. If that happens, pour a little bit of water in there, slush, swash it around, and then dump it in. And make sure you get your whole dose of medication. And then flush it really well with water. At the end, when you've given all your medications, you want to give yourself a good a 30 to 40 milliliter uh, flush of water in your syringe and then flush it all the way through. Uh, when it gets into the tube, clamp off again, remove your syringe, set that aside, put the stopper back on, and then you'd wash your equipment with soap and water and then wash your hands. So that's medication administration through the tube. The last thing that we need to talk about is complications. So if you have any complications or any problems, you'd want to make sure that you call your doctor. Um, you can call me if you have any um, non-urgent problems that I can walk you through, uh, but I'll talk about what you need to, when you need to call your doctor or go to the emergency department. If you're running a fever, especially immediately after your procedure, of 100.4 or greater, you want to call your doctor or go to your emergency department. If you start to notice abdominal swelling, um, nausea, pain, vomiting, especially if you haven't had a bowel movement in a few days, you want to call your doctor or go to your emergency department. Um, if there's redness or swelling at the PEG site or irritation, you want to call your doctor and let them know about that and we can troubleshoot that. If there's discharge though, if there's pus or stomach contents or bleeding from your PEG, call your doctor right away or go to your emergency department. If um, you start to notice, or if you notice that your PEG tube comes out completely, you want to call your doctor as we've already discussed. One other problem that we've kind of talked about a little bit but haven't talked about a solution is if your peg tube clogs. So there are a couple things that you can try to do at home before you call your doctor. And um, one of them is to try to flush your tube forcefully, not too forcefully. You draw up some water in your syringe with the plunger in, in place. 
pull out the stopper, seat your syringe, and then instead of just a slow, gentle flush, you'd unclamp and try to piston it and see if that dislodges this uh, clog. If that doesn't do it, one other thing you can try to do is um, roll the tube between your fingertips and if the clogs uh, above your skin then you might be able to break it up that way. If not, then you need to call your doctor. Don't try to stick anything in the tube to dislodge a clog. Um, we used to tell people to use Pepsi or Coke to try to dissolve a clog. We don't recommend that anymore, so don't try that. There are enzymes that we can give you, but it has to be given by a prescription from your physician, and um, you have to be instructed how to use those. So that would be one potential solution to a clogged um, G, J, or PEG tube. So those are reasons to call your doctor or go to your emergency department. Um, if you have any other questions or problems, please, please feel free to call me after you're discharged. If you have any questions right now, please talk with your nurse or your physician prior to your procedure. And uh, otherwise, good luck with your procedure and take care.